are in our third week here of a series on a tiny little book called Haggai. And if you don't know where Haggai is, it's on page 975 of your <laughs> Bibles. Probably not in your Bible. Um, in my Bible, it is a single page. It's not a big book. It's a minor, minor prophet because it's so short. But an important little book. I think we've been getting some really good stuff out of it. I'm really glad that we decided to work our way through this. And uh, we're going to be in Haggai this week and next week, and that will wrap it up because it's hard to stretch one page of the Bible past about four weeks of uh, sermons. So um, we will have the next two weeks today and next week on this subject, and then we will move on to something else. But uh, if you want to follow along, you're certainly welcome to open your Bibles to Haggai. There's Bibles under the chairs in front of you. If you've got an iPhone, iPad, Android, the U version of the Bible, Bible.org, will open up a, a nice Bible for you to follow along. But I'll give you a quick catch-up if you haven't been here, if you're visiting. Um, Haggai is an interesting book. It's, it's, Haggai is an interesting prophet. He, he's kind of like a, a, a kick to the rear at times, um, but a fun version of it, right? Uh, he doesn't really pull any punches when he's speaking to the people of God. And, and the back story of this is, back in 586 B.C., the nation of Israel um, had, had a period of decline because of their idolatry. And as a result of that, uh, God's judgment on the nation of Israel was he sent in the Babylonians to conquer them. And not only did the Babylonians come in and, and conquer the nation of Israel, uh, they destroyed the temple. This was Solomon's temple. This was one of the wonders of the world, one of the most amazing buildings ever created by man. Uh, they, they, they tear it down, destroy it, they burn it, they knock every stone from on top of every other stone. I mean, there's nothing but a, a pile of rubble when they are done. And then they take the Israelites captive and they drag them 900 miles away in captivity. And so the Israelites live in this captivity uh, for basically the next 50 years until the Persians come along. And the Persians are kind of bigger, badder, meaner, stronger. And so they knock off the Babylonians. But the neat thing about the Persians was well, they were a little bit more religiously tolerant. And so they looked at the Israelites and said, well, why don't you guys go home? You really don't need to be here anymore. We'll let you go practice your own religion. Head back to Jerusalem. Go on up out of your way. So about 50,000 of the Israelites did exactly that. And in that, God commissions them to go back and rebuild the city, to rebuild the people of God, and to rebuild the temple. Uh, and in and, and the first week we looked at this, they were to rebuild this temple. Solomon's temple is what we often refer to it as, but it's a temple there in Israel. Um, they're to go back and rebuild this temple. Well, they get there, and they kind of start laying the foundation, but then all of a sudden persecution comes. Uh, persecution actually from the Samaritans comes, and they just kind of go, I don't want to fight against this. So instead of building God's temple, they go and start building their own homes. And they start building what sounds like some pretty nice homes because scripture told us they they traveled to places like lebanon and gathered wood so they could go back and panel their whole house right because if you know anything about israel there's not a lot of trees to cut down there so they had to travel and they had to transport all this lumber to panel their houses and while doing so neglecting the work that god had set before them neglecting the work on the temple so because of that god sends haggai in and he speaks truth to the people. And he says, hey guys, God is not pleased with you. The fact that he has freed you and you have chosen to neglect the work that he has given you. He has redeemed you and you've chosen just to basically ignore doing the thing that he asked you to do to bring him glory, honor, and praise. Well, in that, God stirs up in their hearts they're repentant. Um, they have a change. They're again reverent towards God. And, and then they realize, oh yeah, we've been working on our houses, not on the temple. So uh, their hearts are transformed. They get their hands involved and they go back and they start working on the temple of God just as God had freed them to do. So they get to work and they get the foundation laid. And as they start to build the temple, this is our second sermon last week, as they start to build this temple up, some of the, some of the older folks who were in the original temple 50, 60 years before, they had seen Solomon's temple. They knew what Solomon's temple looked like. They knew it was amazing. They start to see this new temple going up, and discouragement sets in. They're going, man, 
this thing just doesn't look, it's not, wow, it's just never going to be Solomon's temple. It's like a run-down shack compared to what Solomon built. And so they kind of start groping and grinding, just kind of whining and mumbling and rumbling and grumbling, you know, and just, eh, this is never going to be, man, I just don't see the vision here. Well, the young people, at the same time, had never seen Solomon's temple. And so they see a temple going up, and they're going, praise the Lord! All right, we're getting something done. We're being used. I know people are like, you're being used, but it's ugly. The young people are like, what? we're working hard. We're doing our best. And the older folks are going, yeah, this is, it's ugly. Who picked those colors, right? That must have been a committee, right? No, that's not what they said. It's not scriptural. But you get the idea. So, so you, you have a group that was excited. And you have a group that's disappointed, basically. And what happens is this discouragement seeps into the excited people. And now everybody's kind of like, oh, no, we're down again. And the result of it is they quit working on the temple once again. Um, and so Haggai gets sent back in. And Haggai comes in and speaks again a word of encouragement to them this time. He says, hey, guys, what you don't see is, yes, this might not look like Solomon's temple. It's not going to be covered with gold everywhere, and it's not going to have everything that we once had. But here's the deal. God is going to use this temple. You don't even know how he's going to use it, but it's going to be amazing. Because we know, as New Testament believers, this is the temple where Jesus went to and sat and learned. Remember the story when the mother of God and the father of God lost their child? Right? Left him behind. They're, they're walking home one day and they're like, have you seen Jesus? No. Have you? No. Uh-oh. Where's Jesus? And they got to walk a couple of days' journey back to the temple to find Jesus. There's Jesus at the temple, right? And, and, and Jesus is in this temple, and Jesus learns at this temple, and then G Jesus, as we know, replaces this temple as far as the temple word is speaking. Um, Jesus says to him about himself that you're going to tear this temple down, but in three days I'm going to rise again. And they're all like, who could build this temple in three days? And he's like, no, I'm talking about myself here, right? Because it's going to live, die, and rise again. That's the good news of the gospel. But way back at the time of Haggai, they didn't know that was going to come. And so Haggai's got to come in and say, hey, Something amazing is going to happen because of this. Let's do this. And so he encourages them to hang their hope on the promises of God. God promised he's going to use this. And so he encourages them, and finally they get back to work. And that brings us to today, our third and four uh, messages, as I mentioned before. And, and the people are now back to work. Uh, they're excited once again to be working on the temple. Things are going well. They're encouraged by the work that God is doing. But then, again, another problem arises. Another problem within the nation of Israel comes along. And it kind of happens while they weren't really looking. What happens is some bad theology begins to creep in. Their theology proper, which is simply uh, their understanding of the nature of God, uh, kind of gets confused along with their anthropology, which is their understanding of the nature of man. The understanding of God, the understanding of man. They get stuff kind of confused between the two of them. And two things happen that we're going to see in this message, that as the nation begins to stack stone upon stone, as they begin to rebuild this temple, as they begin to make progress, when they see this progress, they begin to think, hey, because we're making this holy thing, that must mean by association, it's holy, so now we must be holy, right? Right? That's, that's one of the things they're thinking. We're, we're doing this work of God, and because we're doing this work of God, God must be pleased with us because of the work of our hands. And then secondly, the other error that they get into is because they've now turned their hearts to obedience to God, they think, okay, God, we're doing what you told us to do. So that means you have to bless us. Right? I'm doing your work, God. That means you've got to bless us. That's the second error we'll talk about in a little bit. So God sends Haggai in for the third time. 
to correct this errant theology and to show them that no man is good enough on his own to earn both the holiness nor the blessing of God. You see, folks, there is simply no work that in and of itself obligates God to make us holy or to bless us. And if anything, Haggai is going to argue that the only thing we're actually capable of earning is the judgment of God. And and that's because of our, our sin nature, the sin that's in our lives. So if any blessing or if any favor comes our way, it's not because we were good. It's not because we were doing good. It's not because we were good enough to earn it. But it's because of the grace of God. The grace of God being poured out on us because of His goodness, not because of our goodness. So we are going to see again today that this message from 2,600 years ago is the same word that speaks truth to us that we need to hear this again today. And here's one of the key things. It's not our religious activities that save us and sustain us. It's not our religious activities that make us holy before God. It's not even our obedience. It's His work. It's God's work that obligates Him to any blessing that we have in our lives. So in reality, we are in need of the mercy and grace of God to be poured out on us, not for anything that we have done, but for everything that God has chosen to do in love for us. So we're going to look at, uh, uh, starting in Haggai 2, verse 10 today, if you're following along, and I'll read some of the scripture and talk about it, and we'll just keep on moving with it and make it through verse 19, I think, today. It says there in verse 10, On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius, and as we've mentioned before, Haggai is a really neat book as far as history goes because we know exactly to the day when these things happened. So this is effectively December 19th, the year 520 BC. And it's been two months since the last time where Haggai had come to them. It's been four months since the first time Haggai came to them. And then it says, The word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. And in verse 11 it says that Haggai, uh, he's going to summon the priests. And if you don't know about the Old Testament, the priests are the spiritual leaders of the nation of Israel, and it's their job to read, to discern, and then teach the nation uh, the nature of the Torah or, or the law of God. What, what it is in that law that God has demanded for His people so that they move forward in obedience to Him. So that's their task. And so the priests are the ones who understand and interpret Scripture for all the people. And God commands Haggai to go to them to to gather these priests all together. And and, and essentially, when they gather them all together, they're going to put the nation of Israel on trial, so to speak, because of this weird theology that had worked its way in. This, This misunderstanding they had about how they were relating to God. And so now Haggai and the priests are going to so to speak, put on a trial and look for a ruling. So he says in verse 11, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Ask the priests about the law. And here's the first question that is asked. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any other kind of food, does it become holy? This is what Haggai asked. And the priest answered, No. So in other words, because this doesn't make a lot of sense to us, because... When was the last time you carried? Maybe you did in your apron, ladies, or something. But I mean, I, I I don't I don't go around like grabbing my brisket with my shirt or something, right? <laughs> uh, I don't do that. But then that's what happened back in those days. And so, in other words, uh, can an object that is dirty become clean simply because it it rubbed up against something that was holy or pure? See, when in Israel, uh, when when an individual family, or, or even when the whole nation as a whole, had sinned, there was an offering that was demanded because of that. This comes from the Levitical law. Um, and, and so God had set up this law as a chance for the people to be redeemed, to have their sins, their transgressions forgiven. This was a chance for intercession on the part of the people that it might atone for them before the Holy God. And so what was demanded of the people was that you would take an unblemished or a perfect, 
spotless lamb or, or perhaps a goat or a bull. There were some different circumstances that would determine which one was appropriate for the time. But you would take this perfect animal, spotless, unblemished, and then you would set it up on the altar and it would be slaughtered as a sacrifice. And its blood would be shed all over the, the, what's called the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. And, and that blood then would cover the nation's or the person's sin. But then that meat was supposed to go as an offering to be pleasing to God. And, and recognizing that, that the offering was a substitute for their sins, it was important that they kept it holy and pure because they were offering this to God. And that meant if anything whatsoever touched the meat then that meat would become defiled. And they could no longer use it as a sacrifice. So, so imagine you just took your best bull, sacrificed it, and then it was handled improperly. Now it won't cover your sins. Now you've got to go get another bull. And in an agrarian economy, this, this could be a crushing blow financially to your family. I mean, we're talking wiping your herd out if you don't have a bull. So this is a big deal. You have to handle these things properly. And so the priests would be very, very careful. And they would take that meat. And, and they had this special little pocket that was sewn into their, into their priestly robes. So basically, like, like they'd stick their hand into this pocket inside out and reach up, kind of like, you know, you ever done this with a Ziploc bag where you turn it inside out over your hand and you grab something and then you pull it through, right? They're kind of doing that with their robes. and They would grab this meat and make sure that the cloth would keep their hand from touching it. The only thing that would touch it were these ceremonial robes or special robes that were only worn in these places on special days. And they would grab it and they would transport it that way. No human contact could occur with it. And then they would carry the meat to the altar that way, protecting it. And so Haggai asks, if on the way, this garment that he's wearing, this robe, if that garment accidentally touches something on the way in, is that thing that was touched now clean? Is it now holy? And of course the priests go, no, no, it's because just because his robe touched it doesn't make it clean and holy. It doesn't, it, it doesn't work that way. That's not how ceremonial law works. Think of it like this. I don't care how nice, I don't care how new my shoes are, if I run and I jump in a mud puddle, that mud puddle doesn't turn into a brand new shoebox, right? That makes sense more? That's effectively the question that he's asking them. If I jump in mud with my nice new shoes, it's not going to turn into a, a pristine shoebox. And in the same way, they had to be careful with these things. And if something touched it, it didn't make it holy. In the same way, think of it this way. We can catch a cold, but we can't catch health, right? I wish I could catch health, but I could catch a cold. And so the priests go, no, it, it, it can't be made holy or clean. So as in is a, a typical trial, so to speak, let's bring an exhibit B. Hey guys, going to get some of the priests to prove that it works quite the opposite. So in verse 13, Haggai said, If someone who is unclean were to contact a dead body and touches any of these things, does it become unclean? So he's, he's proved it from one side, now he's going to prove it from the other. And in Leviticus, in Leviticus 22, uh, in the religious ceremonial law for the nation of Israel, it states that if a person, a member of the nation of Israel, touched a dead body, whether it was during burial or it was just accidental, it doesn't matter. If they just simply touched it, they were unclean. And what that means is you were then not allowed to go into the temple services because you had been defiled. You had been deemed unclean. And so what you would have to do is you would have to go and you would have to wash themselves in a ceremonial bath and then you would have to literally live outside of the camp until evening before you were deemed ceremonial clean once again. And if you were to come into camp, everybody would run from you. Because if you touched them, you made them unclean because you had not completed this process. So Haggai asks, if somebody who's become unclean by contact comes in contact with a dead body and then they touch something, how does it work? What happens? Well, the priests say, well, it becomes unclean. And so 
We know from both sides of this argument that it's impossible to commute or transmute or share holiness, but that we can pick up the unholiness, the uncleanness. Think of it this way, like when you're doing laundry, this is always my fear, you're doing a load of, load of whites, right? And you, you mistakenly let a red sock sneak in. <laughs> right? Now, apparently, everything I own is pink for the next year. Anybody ever done that? Yeah. That's the worst. And it's, it's that same idea. Uh, uh, I said this last week, uh, a little leavening leavens the whole loaf. That little bit of impurity, that little bit of corruption, that unclean thing, can taint all of it. And so that's the ruling that's given here in the ceremonial law. Paul even says this in 1 Corinthians 5. He says that leavening, that little bit, gets into the loaf, like I said. And so we need to understand that holiness cannot be transmitted by contact, but uncleanliness and unholiness can be. So so why does Haggai share this? What does this matter? Well, in verse 13 it says, And Haggai answered this, So it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord. And so it is with every work of their hands. And what they offer there is unclean. So basically what it's saying is in a sense, the Haggai is coming and saying, all of this work that you have been doing for the last 15 years, basically back to before God revamped your hearts, all of the work that you have done to rebuild this temple, God says is unclean. You're doing it for the wrong reasons. The nation, when they had returned to Jerusalem, the first thing they did is they set up altars for worship and they reinstituted the feasts and the festivals and they had started rebuilding the temple. But then they got off track. And God essentially says, everything you did from then till now is unclean. I don't care how great your religious activity was, your hearts weren't clean. You were doing it for the wrong motivation. Therefore, everything you have touched is not holy. Remember I said one of the problem is they were thinking that, hey, look, we're building the temple, so now we must be holy automatically because of that, right? And what God says to them is the exact opposite. You have desecrated it. Everything you have done is for naught. Again, why? Because their hearts were unclean. You see, these were narcissistic, self-absorbed idol worshippers who gave the appearance of devotion, but they were secretly committed to their own pursuits. And even now, even though their their hearts now had been changed, even though they'd finally now, in this third appearance of, of Haggai, gotten back to work in the temple, even though they had this outward appearance that looked like devotion, in reality they still felt in their hearts that it was the work that they were doing that was going to make them clean. And God says to them, you just don't get it. Just because you've gotten back to work, just because you're moving forward, just because you're seeing some work go up on the temple, that doesn't suddenly automatically make you holy. That doesn't obligate me to anything in regards to you. And in, in, in this case, there was a famine that had been going on. God had sent a famine to try to get their attention, to quit working on their houses and to go work on the temple. And so God had cut out all the grapes and all the different grains and the animals weren't doing well. And and God is saying to them, I want your hearts, not your hands. It's not your hands that make you clean. It's your heart. It's a cleansed heart from within, not your external work. So do you see what's going on here in these first verses? You have a people who've been redeemed by God. They've been released to go and do the work on the temple. Their hearts were originally stirred up. There's some zeal for the work that's going on. But along the way, they get this misguided theology that tells them if if I do this, if I do this, and I do this, and I do this, then God will love me. Right? Then God will deem me as holy. Then, if I've done this, this, and this, then God is going to be obligated to bless me. Right? Wrong. But do we find this very same understanding in our culture? Absolutely we do. It's rampant. 
not only all over the whole earth, but it's specifically here in Western culture. We live in the midst of this exact thinking. That's the problem we have. And the problem that we have here today is twofold. One is legalism. It's that feeling, if I do, if I do, if I do, if I do, then I will be acceptable to God, right? If I do enough, I can earn God's favor. You ever met anybody like that? I have. Or, or there's kind of that other, this is the way I used to operate before I was a Christian. It's not so much that if I do enough, if I don't do enough. If, if I don't do, if, I, if I'm not as bad as Steve, you know? Because isn't God going to grade on a curve? All I've got to do is be better than Steve. Steve. And Steve's not very good, man. I know what he was doing last, not this Steve. Well, maybe this Steve, I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, that's how I used to operate. I, I would think, well, I haven't murdered anybody. Right? I haven't raped or pillaged any villages like Vikings. I haven't done most of the Ten Commandments the wrong direction. So I'm pretty good. God must like me, right? And, and because I'm seeing some good things happen, oh, he must love me. He must be pouring his blessing out on me. There's a lot of people who live day to day functionally that way. We find that in our culture. One of the places you see this, you see this on TV. A lot of, a lot of evangelists, televangelists, not evangelists, televangelists. You'll see this in the prosperity gospel. That says, if you will only believe enough, if you will only send in enough money, then Jesus will love you and he will bless you. And if he doesn't love you and bless you now, that means you didn't send, up enough, send us enough money, so send some more money. And to make it easy for you, we've got people on the line who will take your credit card. Right? It's in our culture. This is one of the most tragic things America has exported to the greater world. It's this idea that says, because I'm his... He owes me everything. That's good. So legalism and the prosperity gospel. Two horrible, terrible things. And this is exactly what they were experiencing back at the time of Haggai. It was a mess. Now, to understand grace, and I want to talk about this for a little moment. Grace is simply unmerited favor. There's nothing that you or I can do, either before or after salvation, that can make you, because of your work, more acceptable to God. See, folks, our acceptance comes in and through Christ alone. If you're following along in your Bibles, turn over to Titus 2. I want to show you a snapshot of what morality looks like. Morality post-salvation. What does obedience and morality look like for the believer that has been saved by the grace of God? Titus 2 says in verse 11, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. And you probably won't find any clearer passages reflecting the very nature of the gospel, past, present, and future, than right here in this passage. And let me explain what this passage is saying here. See, prior to faith in Jesus Christ, most people believed in God and then when asked, how do you find the favor of God? How do you become acceptable in the sight of God? They would basically say, well, my works, right? If I go to my garage and I get my ladder up and I start climbing those rungs of the ladder, eventually I can get high enough on the, on the rungs, on the ladder of works where God will see me, where God will notice me, where God will bless me. And then as we climb up our ladders... Right? As we climb up those, so to speak, faith ladders, I can get up a little higher and I can see who's below me. So there's Steve, down below me. I'm higher. I'm doing good. Oh, somebody got one on me. I better go do some more. Climb a little bit higher. Right? We just, we climb up these ladders, thinking we could somehow climb our way to God. 
Somehow we can elevate ourselves. But the very nature of the gospel, folks, simply says that man is not good enough. We cannot earn the favor of God. We cannot climb. There's no ladder made that's high enough to get us there, to reach God's blessing. The book of Isaiah specifically says, even our very best deeds are as if they were filthy rags before a holy God. Encouraging, right? Thanks, Pastor. But here is the good news. Because you can't earn it, God has provided it for you. In providing His Son, Jesus Christ, verse 11 happens. For the grace of God has appeared. It's not the law anymore. You don't have to climb the ladder anymore. You don't have to climb the ladder to earn your salvation. Why? Because grace has come down. It's taken down those ladders. God's grace through Jesus Christ has been offered as a sacrifice on our behalf. We don't have to go to the temple and make sacrifices anymore. God has done one sacrifice once and for all. In Philippians 2, Paul says that even Jesus, the Son of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. But He emptied Himself and He took on the form of flesh of a bond servant, it says, who eventually died a criminal's death on our behalf, on a cross. And then three days later, rose from a grave so that we might be cleansed and forgiven. So most of us, when we come to this point, we grab verse 11 and we go, I get it. It's not about me anymore, right? It's not about things that I do that can earn my salvation. And now all I have to do is believe and trust in Jesus Christ and follow Him. But then what happens when we get to verses 12 through 14? We get to this idea of renouncing ungodliness, of putting beyond us the worldly possessions, of living self-controlled, upright, godly lives, of being zealous for good works. And we look at that and go, see, it was grace that saved me, but now i got some work to do. Because of what God has done, now I need to live a life that's pleasing to Him. So even though we get the grace of God in verse 11, when it comes to living for God on a daily basis, we do get out that ladder and go to work. But we're no longer doing that work to climb that ladder for our glory. We're climbing that ladder to make much of Jesus. So now when I get up on my ladder and I see Steve below me, I go, hey Steve, come up here with me. Here's how I got here. You're part of the family. Come on in. Hey, Steve, I want to disciple you. Let me tell you how I changed. Let me tell you how Jesus changed me. That's how it's supposed to work. Now here's something, I don't know, I think it's a little interesting about this passage. Because the expectation of a believer is listed there in verses 12 through 14, we now know what a Uh, a holy life should look like. A holy life before the Lord. But how do we do that? It's the first word in verse 12, if you're looking at Titus there. It's the word training. It's the same word we get the word pedagogy from. It's this idea of of a parent or an instructor teaching a child, investing, instructing a student. So what is it that trains us? Well, it tells us in verse 10. Is it the law? No. Is it that you pick yourself up by your own bootstraps? That kind of morality? No. Is it that if we do enough work, we can earn it? No. The subject that trains us up is grace. Grace in verse 11. Don't miss this. It's huge. This is huge to our theology as Christians. What Paul is saying in verse 12 is that the same grace that saved you is the same grace that sustains you. It's the same grace that sanctifies you. There is no difference. You you, you don't take that ladder down. You use it in a different way. Grace at both ends of it. So as a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've gotten to the place, to the point where you feel like 
you have to perform some sort of religious activity in order for God to love you, to be accepted to God, you've missed the whole point. You've gone back to the law. And I'm calling you to come back to the grace of God. There's nothing we can do. We can never invest enough in our own holiness to make ourselves holy. It's like saying, if I go to church enough, I'll be a Christian. Do we have that in our culture? Yeah. We get a lot of people say, oh yeah, are you a Christian? Yeah, I go to this church. And that's not the same question. Are you a Christian? Yeah, that's my church. That's my pastor. No. Are you a Christian? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? That's completely different than if you walk into a building. That'd be like saying, oh yeah, because I walk into McDonald's, now I'm a Big Mac. <laughs> right? That doesn't make sense. Just because you walk in the walls, in the doors of a building, doesn't make you what it is that's inside of that building. You're not a Christian because you go to church. You're Christian because Jesus is your Lord and Savior. we got to get that right. And there's a lot of people who live in a fog of a misunderstanding. And I do not say this in any way critical, because I was that person. And we need to understand that there is nothing that we can do to make God love us more. And there's nothing that we can do to make God love us less. That is good news. Why? Because God doesn't love us based on our performance. He loves you based on His Son, Jesus. That's the beauty of Christianity. That's what makes it different. That is the beauty of what our faith is in. That is what we believe. Now, once we have that grace, yes. The book of James. Grace compels us to obey. Grace compels us to works. Why? Because it's our delight. It's our joy. Because of what God has done for me. Because God has saved me. A lowly sinner like me. I once was lost. But now I'm found. I, I used to be blind, but now I can see. Because of that, praise the Lord, let me do some good works. Praise the Lord, let me return some glory to Him. Praise the Lord, let me do something. Let me be on the team, put me in coach, I'm ready to play. That is what grace does, it frees us. And the work we do is for God and not for us. You see, it's the motive that makes the difference. Grace compels us, not out of fear, not of, not of inadequacy. Grace compels us, though, to go and live and love and serve Jesus. If we don't get that right, we're just the same as all the other religions in the world. If you study Islam, if you study Mormonism, Jehovah's Witness, if you study Hinduism, if you study Buddhism, works-based righteousness. It's what I do that will earn me my way. Christianity is not about what I do. It's about what was done. What was done for me on a cross a little over 2,000, well, about 2,000 years ago, I guess. Before I even lived. God had a plan to save me. A lowly sinner for you and me. This is the key to us understanding. See, back at the time of Haggai, they thought if we work harder, if we work on these holy things, that's going to make us holy. God said wrong. That's not the way it works. If you work that way, you're under the curse of the law. But we are not under the curse of the law. We are under the good news and the grace of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to wrap up with this thought and then we'll get out of here. There's nothing else that can save us. There's nothing else that can take away our sins. I don't care if you work every minute of every day for the rest of your lives. You are not good enough to earn God's love. Hear that. But the 
good news is he doesn't leave it there. He provides an opportunity. He says, no, I'm not going to leave you alone. Here's a chance at redemption. I love you. Not only do I love you, I'm willing to forgive you. Just let me be Lord of your life. That's all I ask. Make much of me. And if your motivation is right, if you make much of God and give Him the glory, honor, and praise, then amazing and abundant things happen. So we're going to pray here in a moment. If you've never had that opportunity in your life, I would just encourage you today to be serious about that. To hear that God loves you. You can't earn that love and you can't lose that love. He loves you no matter what. So let's pray.